You are listening to a free version of Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with With Sam Steeter. It's Tuesday, March 20th, 2018. My name is Michael Brooks on a Michael Tuesday This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We're broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On today's program, Patrick Blanchfield on why the market can't solve the gun massacre issue, how neoliberal logic pollutes all of our public policy programs, and the gun debate and how to respond to it specifically a deep and different kind of dive on a uniquely American catastrophe. Maybe not a crisis because it's ongoing. Speaking of which, multiple injuries have been reported in the shooting at St. Mary's High School, which is in Great, uh, Great Mills High School in Southeast Maryland. Unfortunately, uh, fortunately, as of now, there's no casualties only a couple of injuries will keep you posted so horrifying news to fit with the horrifying program M- bombs set off or diffused rather in austin as an investigation of the mail bombings targeting apparently people of color in that city continues cambridge analytica caught on tape Talking bribes, sex tapes, and for a firm that guides right-wing nativist campaigns, they have a very global mindset in their client list. Trump considering a legal reshuffle. One lawyer out on the way out. One lawyer resigning. One lawyer to be fired. One lawyer to resign. And one lawyer who makes up conspiracies about the FBI to be hired. We got to become tr- Trump spokespeople. Finally, some getting point. my guys in there. Finally, getting a little bit serious. <laughs> Democrats on track for gains of thirty to forty-five seats, according to experts. Although we've learned uh, never to trust those experts in their predictions, but things looking good for Democrats. Supreme Court is not going to intervene in the Pennsylvania redistricting case giving Democrats the advantage in a much more reality-based mapping process and major primary day in Illinois today, an opportunity to take out an anti-reproductive rights right-wing Democrat and two Democratic oligarchs in the Democratic Party primary for governor, all that, and much, much more. On today's Majority Report, Sam is really not feeling well so uh i i think yeah i was slotted to do thursday might well still do thursday but regardless he he thankfully he's taking the rest rest sam usually me if i don't feel good i don't push it i rest the whole office is falling apart the whole office i'm the only one who's been uh are you okay though? Because you've been I don't coughing know. I've the been past worried. couple of weeks. Yeah, I've been yeah. worried the last couple of days, especially. I don't understand because for me, I don't really get colds very much. I just, I just from time to time get these goddamn these migraines. Jesus, I've had they've they've cut in frequency, but they're awful. Yeah, I was I just read about migraines on Splinter, and it's like way worse than I ever imagined it was. Yeah, I don't have them. I don't, you didn't I've need to them. read about migraines. You could have learned from my lived experience to use one of mm. your people's favorite phrases. <laughs> you seem like you're doing fine, though. You're not sick. I, I, I feel like a constant low level of sickliness that never really develops into what? anything. Yeah. Okay. Like a little tired, a little out of it. Uh, I actually, I have got Epstein Barr virus, so that's oh, so that, but that's, that's like an actual why. thing that you're dealing with. Yeah. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah. So become a member of the majority report today, because <laughs> we we really need to fortify our health around here. <laughs> Buy some emergency for the office. Actually, it's not a bad idea. Um, 
maybe we should start broadcasting the show like in those SARS masks that they wore, like when the disease was traveling around. Yeah. Uh, you never can be too careful. Yeah. I see the I see people with those at airports, and I'm always jealous and wish I had them. When I see like a like older um, Asian lady with like a really nice looking like back pillow, like one of those, and she's walking around, and she's got the mask, and she's got the pillow, and she's like carrying sneakers but has slippers on i'm like that woman they're they are the masters of flying <laughs> no one does it better well that they wear those masks to be polite usually when they're sick well that's right i look that up. right that's nice I mean, westerners like, like, <laughs> yeah. hey is this the right line is this the boarding line <laughs> like, as an american we're okay. we're also afraid of getting each other's germs i just assumed they were wearing it because they were afraid of germs but no no, they're just, just being, being nice. polite. No, Americans are we're we're we're, bo- we're rude hypochondriacs. Um, <laughs> Channel Four in the UK, James O'Keefe, as Matt would say, "Eat your heart out." That little schmuck. They did an actual, really good piece of video journalism here, uh, where they. Uh, they basically they posed as a Sri Lankan businessman who was looking to fund political campaigns in Sri Lanka and wanted to contract Cambridge Analytica. Now, it's actually a 20 minute documentary. I found a lot of other pieces actually in some ways more interesting than this. The fact that they do uh, uh, they work for Kenyatta on both of his elections in Kenya. They do work in Eastern Europe. They do work on the uh, corporate side in China that was alluded to how they set up. Um, independent companies and LLCs, presumably, to uh, get paid through but not leave a trail that they're working in different countries. They definitely they talk about ghosting and campaigns and working discreetly. I, I think these things are actually in some ways the more prevalent and day in and day out things that we have to watch that apply to Cambridge Analytica and a whole other world of global political consultants, influence managers, and people that are connected with private intelligence firms, intelligence services. And as Yevgeny Morozov pointed out yesterday, uh, I think on Twitter, hopefully he'll elaborate on it, that the same tactics that people are decrying now as they have been turned inward in UK and United States-based campaigns, Brexit and Trump specifically in Cambridge Analytica's case, these same methods of uh, seeding and influence peddling and opinion shaping through social media and data mining um, were utilized by Western governments to shape foreign policy strategy and foreign uh, propaganda. Cambridge Analytica uh, claims that they have two distinct businesses, but they also work uh, on behalf of military uh, campaigns and, 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 and with Western military services. So the notion that those two things would not be connected at the very, even the most gentle and benign in terms of intellectual frameworks is delusional. A couple of years ago uh, in 2016, and I'm going to elaborate on this on my show tonight, there was a piece about a Colombian hacker who was serving a jail sentence for admitted crimes of electoral fraud, Um, and campaign hacking for right-wing candidates across Latin America. He worked for a prominent Venezuelan political consultant who's based in Miami named J.J. Rendon and worked on campaigns in El Salvador, Colombia, and Mexico, and so on. If you read that article and the types of things that he admitted to with very documented evidence in the Bloomberg piece, you realize that, again, it's first of all, everybody is doing this. Rush is doing this. We're doing this. Campaign consultants are doing this. Intelligence services are doing this. Private intelligence services are doing this. And um, Mercer's, as an example, with Cambridge Analytica, f- funding them as a company. There's enormous private sector interest in this stuff. So if we could start to draw back the Russia conversation to be a doorway into a broader conversation about manipulation of public through social data and mining, that's the bigger picture story and the longer term concern. And it's going to apply to every government consultancy and private agency in the planet. Now, that being said, here's the fun salacious part where is a final meeting um, with Channel 4. And this is with a secret camera. This is Cambridge Analytica CEO 
uh, Nix, I believe his last name is. Um, maybe you could. Yeah, I don't know his first name. Uh, okay. It, uh, excuse me, Alexander Nix. This is the first meeting that he is at with the pose with the journalists who are posing as Sri Lankan representatives, and they talk about setting up honey traps. Send some girls around to the candidate's house. We have lots of history. Thanks. For example, you're saying when you're using the girls to introduce to the mini, to the local fellow, mm -hmm. and you're using the girls for this, like, the seduction, they're not local girls, not Sri Lankan girls. I wouldn't have thought so. Okay. You could bring some... I mean, just, that was just an idea. Yes. Yeah. You could bring some Ukrainians in okay. on holiday with us. You know? Right, right, right. You know what I'm saying? Yes. They are very beautiful Ukrainian girls. They are very beautiful. Yes. I uh, find that works very well. Please don't pay too much attention to what I'm saying, mm. because I'm just giving you examples of what can, happen. What can be done and what, or what has been done. Um, I mean, deep digging is interesting, mm. but, uh, you know, you know, equally effective can be just to go and uh, speak to the incumbents and to um, offer them a deal that's too good to be true and make sure that that's video recorded. You know, these sorts of tactics are very effective. Now, what I like is he said these are things that could and I believe have been done, which is a good, interesting word choice because in their denial, they actually, Cambridge Analytica says we never engage in legal activity uh, or the type of behavior described here. And what we do is we try to suss out clients and see if their intention is to get us to do something illegal. Let's just play the second piece of sound of uh, Cambridge Analytica employee Mark Turnbull. He's the managing director of global politics on using hope and fear to affect behavior change. I think actually this is structurally more to the point in kind of understanding how these firms work in their, their frameworks. It's no good fighting uh, an election campaign on the facts because actually it's all about emotion. Two fundamental human drivers mm. um, uh, when it comes to taking information on board uh, effectively are hopes and fears and many of those are unspoken and even unconscious. You didn't know that was a fear until you saw something that just evoked that reaction from you. Right, right, right. And our job is to get, is to drop the bucket further down the well than anybody else, to understand what are those really deep-seated underlying fears, concerns. And what's great about that is that some of this is very smart and effective, and some of this is also, you know, its own form of pseudoscience and woo to hustle a presumably super wealthy Sri Lankan <laughs> to spit them a ton of money to manipulate campaigns. But there you have it. These are the people. They were, you know, Steve Bannon, I believe, was a on the board. The Mercers invested in this. Michael Flynn has recently acknowledged, Mike Flynn, that he uh, was involved with them, uh, and they have been a major force in the consulting side of the global right wing. And there's always been parallel track consulting firms with um, global political movements or global political governance. We'll be right back with Patrick Blanchfield on the Majority Report. <laughs> Never know that the Gideon star. Never know that the Gideon star. When all the money that they have from get a youth ain't enough to fly you to Mars. When, when the system you defend start break down like a Lego. When the whole world becomes a ghetto. That's when you realize the whole we are ghetto people. Ghetto people. So tell me some bosses slave don't forget the people. Call them all. Remember, Haile Selassie never left the people. No time at all, the people in it. Oh, no. Hey, give me.
me a phone at the Maca, I tell no grabber. Let me call and set up on every dim proper. Every you tap shut up at the zigzagger. Let me show you what a clock a strike in a jam rack. Politician, them my chat a tongue sharp like Maca. Them not no vision, them a scammer. We are way bigger now. What kind of honor? Who no not treat the youth with honor? Let me show no our vibes. Not we are living uptown when the banks fall down. Then the wall we a get a youth. I mean, poor you rich, but when the poor shift, then the wall we a get a youth. I mean, black you white, but when famine strike, then the wall we a get a youth. On that day when you trade your Rolls Royce for a grain of rice, that's a when you realize that the wall we a get the people. Welcome back to the Majority Report. Michael Brooks here. Joining us now is Patrick Blanchfield. He's a freelance journalist and a faculty member at the Brooklyn Institute for Social Research. Patrick, how are you doing? Doing great. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, you have this piece in Splintered, Why the Market Can't Solve a Massacre. And you do a lot in this piece, but you actually begin, I think, with a really useful sort of restating and reorientation of, one, of this phrase, neoliberalism which is, I think, it, it, it's actually helpful to kind of restate and reorient in clear terms what it means to people pretty regularly. So can you start by just giving us your description of what neoliberalism is? Sure. Um, so, and of course, it is one of those terms that gets tossed around and becomes super polemical, but I think it's very helpful to use it as a concept. And mm -hmm. the way I would define it would be as a, a kind of capitalism that's a, sorry, an ideology of political economy, a way of doing business and a way of doing politics that's all about, on the one hand, um, privatization and austerity and uh, deregulation, but that's also about shifting the burden for various social problems to private industry on the one hand and to individual people on the other. So one way of looking at it is it's a philosophy of governance that sees everything that happens in, in the state as being a question of the market, that understands political life as market activity and that understands the role of individuals as basically consumers first and foremost, as human capital rather than as people. So how are you seeing that specifically play out in the reactions to the gun massacre? Because it seems like you know, there's this very tired, I mean, there's this exhausting, tired pattern here where some obscenity, you know, just one of these stories happens, like even this morning's thing happened in Maryland. And it's so it's so disturbing that, you know, you get into a process where it's like, or at least speaking for myself, where it's like, OK, well, there weren't any uh, fatalities. So, oh, this is horrible. But OK, you know, that's less bad. Right. Like we've almost got it. It's gotten to normalized to the point that we're actually kind of like playing these things against each other when, of course, they're all signs of, you know, incredible cultural sickness and danger and totally unacceptable. These events happen, then, you know, Republicans do their, you know, nothing can be done, thoughts and prayers. Maybe, maybe... Democrats kind of offer some type of sort of piecemeal technical thing, which, by the way, usually, uh, it, you know, sort of falls disproportionately on individuals again, not uh, companies or industries. And then we're sort of stuck there. How do you see the underlying neoliberal uh, symptoms in the rhetoric and the response to these shootings? Sure. So whenever one of these things happens, I think it's really helpful to just pause for a moment and like analyze what are our reflexive responses, right? Just us as individuals, but also people that produce headlines and politicians who have to come up with statements very quickly, right? What do what are what are the metaphors we use? What are sort of the positions we take? And also running through that, what sort of the implicit relation to what's understood to be the norm in all of them. Right, one way of thinking about neoliberalism, and this is a quote from Margaret Thatcher, right, is that it's, it's, it's a philosophy that's sort of a philosophy that shows that there's no alternative, mm -hmm. right? It simply presents things as the way they are. 
<clears throat> so to consider like the idea that you know people be like after this latest shooting in some high school somewhere it's absolutely tragic because consider all these all the innocence of the people who are killed and all the future that they, the potential the lives cut short these people could have gone on to become entrepreneurs they're human, all this type of stuff right mm-hmm. and well the question then becomes well you know shootings happen all the time right in this country not necessarily like rampage spree killings but there's a steady churn of gun violence right. that happens daily 33,000 people so w- what is it that makes this specific event so horrifying and it's strange how the, uh, the rhetoric almost is very frequently well um these people are assets they have a potential this is not a space in which viol- in which gun violence should be happening well the implicit half of that is well where should gun violence be happening Right, and that that idea that it, gun violence is normalized and acceptable and not newsworthy and almost deserved in these other spaces is pretty striking. And one thing that I think that these mass shootings sort of exemplify in a very disturbing way is how that normalization keeps creeping out into more and more spaces. Hmm. Right, obviously, as opposed to simply saying, "God, no one deserves to be shot." whether or not they're walking on a corner in Baltimore or they're in a high-end charter school, right? right? Or, or the idea that no one deserves to be shot regardless of whether or not they're quote-unquote innocent. No one deserves to be shot regardless of whether or not they're going to go on to invent the killer app or, you know, have a 401 Actually, but... maybe they should be shot if they're going to do a killer app. <laughs> that, yeah, I was um, just want yeah, to add a little wrinkle to that, yeah. But there is like this. this, this what, 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 the, the, the theme here is like a recession of political responsibility and moral imagination yeah. in favor of just these like constantly tacking the sails to like, well, you know, this shouldn't be happening here. Instead of being like, no, this shouldn't be happening at all anywhere. And that I think is a, is a position that's both emotional, but also um, about like political imagination and policy, and and that sense of this steady recession of like, well, it's, there's nothing we can do here. This is just how it is. This continuing reassertion of an ever grimmer reality is just the norm. That's a, a feature that it's not just present in, mass, in, in our reaction to mass shootings and gun violence, right? It's present in our reaction to climate change. It's present yep. in our reaction to like public health and health care, right? This idea of being like, well, something, someone's got to pay for it. Something terrible is going to happen. It just shouldn't be happening in this one space. Yeah, you you quote. I mean, I'm just going to quote you briefly because I love. You said our political rhetoric, like our moral imagination, uses the vocabulary and logic of the market, assets and investments, of incentive and innovation. Your personal health is an asset which you must safeguard through savvy navigation of an insurance marketplace, shopping for doctors and medications, and close readings of complicated medical bills. And then this, maybe we'll get specifically to the sort of more neoliberal and democratic side of it, because, you know, the Republicans are the quite obvious villains, but they track each other here. And this is where it creeps into more, quote-unquote, humanitarian rhetoric, just to finish your graph here. Immigrants, too, are assets. Human resources who financial contributions to their communities and potential for entrepreneurship become a pivot upon which we can hang appeals for empathy and support. This man being tragically deported by ICE is a successful small business owner. This drowned child refugee could have been the next Steve Jobs, and so on. Yeah, and in all these cases, it's like one doesn't, simply being human isn't enough. You have to add value, mm-hmm. right? You have to have had the potential to be monetizable for some other purpose or for some other interest. The idea that your humanity implies absolute obligations on the part of other humans and from your government is is taken away in terms of basically like a calculus of efficiency and optimizing impacts and incentives and outcomes. It, it, it all gets laundered into this logic that sounds hyper-rational and very adult and mature, but that really is about degrading our claim to having certain absolute rights or certain basic rights. And that's happening across the board. And that's that's one of the that that's the that's the neoliberal wasteland in a nutshell. Yeah, and attack to that neoliberal wasteland in this conversation, we are con- we're sort of always decrying like, you know, there's no action on guns. We're not doing anything. There isn't any regulatory package that's going to pass. I think that's a conversation we have to get to uh, in a couple of minutes as well. Uh, there's nothing, you know, uh, even more deeply, we're not addressing the 
alienation and the you know public health aspects of these things. None of these things are being addressed. That's another kind of common rhetorical track. But actually, uh, something you point out is that actually, according to that same neoliberal logic, these shootings are being addressed in the form of a new industry of private security contracts, security drills in schools, and a new culture, which once again, if we want to broaden the conversation, had already been, you know, very, very, from a race and class perspective, militarization of schools and, you know, policing and monitoring and tracking of children of color and of different class backgrounds is already totally ingrained, but now is kind of broadening out. Um, there's a market opportunity here. So there actually is a response, but it's playing out according to the same degraded wasteland logic. That's exactly right. Like neoliberalism is a, it, it's a way of doing business. It's a way of monetizing problems and also creating new problems to be monetized. It has no inherent sort of value structure beyond that, beyond those ideas of efficiency and optimization, right? So on the one hand, you can see, and not just looking at mass shootings, you could look at other forms of the gun debate, and you can see a certain neoliberal logic in those too, right? In many states, um, the question of carrying a gun in public or it concealed or otherwise is basically a question of navigating certain institutions and paying money to get licensed. And then there's an entire ecosystem of training that you can get to do it better and insurance that you could have in case you shoot someone and you can retain a lawyer in advance for a potential self-defense, etc. So there's a way in which like the control scheme, the gun control scheme sometimes does involve neoliberalism. But here within that shooting specifically, yeah, we basically have created a multi-billion dollar industry for school security. Um, we talk increasingly about adding incentives. Like, let's, let's give a teacher 500 bucks so they can carry a gun, right? Let's, mm -hmm. let's put this on them. And so on the one hand, there's a tremendous monetization, right? There's, oh, this is a lot of money that we're talking about here. Also, money that's being dispersed to private sector players while at the same time we're cutting school funding, mm -hmm. right? That's the other part of the neoliberal thing, right? We're, we're hollowing out these institutions and enriching the private sector. But then also, because the private sector can't fix this problem, because it's, it's a political political problem that requires politicians to take action and instead of just deferring to the market, uh, what this means is that individuals are left in the lurch and they're holding the slack. And so we start training our kids to do active shooter drills. We start asking teachers to, to in addition to being, you know, all that we already ask teachers to do, we're asking them now to be, you know, test coaches and preps, uh, job like prep people and counselors and grief counselors too, Jesus. But also now they, they also have to be able to like hold open doors and take a bullet for their kids. Right? They have to be prepared to kill, kill potentially one of their own students who comes in with a gun. Right? So, so, so this, there's a lot of emotion, like very real financial labor that's put on people, but also really powerful amounts of emotional labor and just cognitive labor and attention that you have to spend. And just this is an idea that people are put in ever individual, while on the one hand, government withdraws, and on the other hand, up, the private sector is enriched, individuals are put in positions of ever more attenuated precarity, vulnerability, and more and more demands are being put on them to fix problems that individuals just can't solve. And weren't designed to solve. And actually, two quick points after that. This is another great example of how, and just the, the subtlety here of the distinction, I don't think there's anybody who, I mean, this isn't even a left in some way, very rarely, I mean, <laughs> most things are left and right things. But I mean, if you have a sort of passing grounding in reality, obviously you're disturbed by Donald Trump. But the flip here, and I, I, I like when you're when Trump went out and he said, you know, like we gotta give kids, we gotta give teachers guns, and you know it'll be interesting, and some of them will be good, and you know, and and this reaction like of so many people to say, oh, there he goes again, he's a lunatic, which is true. But the distinction being that actually, if you were looking at things on the natural continuum, the policies we've already set and the incentive structures we've already created, like all too many other things, this guy is just in his own, you know, vile, bizarre way following the natural logic to its conclusion. Like, why wouldn't you have armed teachers? If we're not going to do anything on a public policy level, if we're going to, you know, outsource security contracts, if we need to basically just have schools in some form of kind of permanent terror and lockdown, because obviously we're not going to do anything about it from a policy perspective. Well, inside that demented world, he's right. 
that's absolutely it, it, it's not he's not an outlier i mean he's an outlier in the sense that he puts these things in ways that are so incredibly bald and stupid that you're like oh my god how is this real right. but in terms of that broader movement right there's a, there's a term for this in a lot of the literature that studies neoliberalism and that that term is responsabilization mm-hmm. you responsibilize right as government recession as, as government re- withdraws from as the state withdraws from taking responsibilities and the social services are slashed the responsibility is delegated to individuals it's their individuals are in other words responsibilized right they're made responsible for this problem and this is there in, in Trump in, in, when he's wanting to arm teachers, and it's also there in, you know, after the Parkland thing when his response was, well, you know, these kids need to be coming forward more and, and, and reporting on kids who are problem makers, right, kids who have the red flags. And again, think about that, not, think about that as a kind of, it's a kind of victim blaming. Right, like right. these students who are getting murdered should have also. It's partially their own fault because they weren't doing enough free labor as surveillance professionals on their classmates. Yep. And likewise, if you look like one of the movements on Twitter, right, I've seen is they in response to the walkout. Right, it's it's no walk, don't walk out, walk up, or something else like that. Where the idea is <laughs> don't kids, band no, together no, in solidarity, them. snitch on each other. Exactly. Don't be political. Do unpaid labor as counselors to prevent yourself from getting shot in a situation in which you shouldn't be taking a bullet anyways. Right. And that's, that's, you couldn't have a starker, like, commandment that, like, responsibilizes people than that, right? Don't protest. Don't have solidarity. Just do more work to make sure you don't eat the bullet. And, of course, that, that doesn't, much in the same way as, like, our individually recycling isn't going to fix the problem of, like, global warming. Our individually intervening with individual kids to, like, try and tell them not to, like, shoot to shoot up their schools when they have abundant access to weapons in the first place. Like, these are all kinds of triage. It's busy work that doesn't affect the actual problem. Now, speaking of not addressing the actual problem, you also get to the the more, I mean, just, you know, we'll, we'll put the lens in now more specifically. The also completely, you know, the, the, the other classic dynamic of contemporary politics where the Republicans hold a, you know, very, very, very far right, very extreme position, which is do nothing. And then, of course, you, I mean, you know, I, I like that you pointed this out, not as a question of hypocrisy, because that's a useless way of looking at Republicans. But you did point out the inversion of a party that's willing to sacrifice every type of civil liberty due process, uh, you know, expectation or law imaginable when it comes to a terrorist event all of a sudden adopts a, well, you know, hey, man, you know, this is just freedom and, you know, pray because we're going to do absolutely nothing, zero on a policy level about guns. But then, on the other hand, Democrats don't exactly, like, what they're offering fits inside, and I guess you could draw more parallels to, uh, you know, yes, maybe it would provide some improvements over the status quo, just as Obamacare provided some very real improvements, but once again fit inside or accommodated this underlying sickness, which is bleeding us out. That's yeah. Like the Democrats are very are personally disappointing to me on this very frequently, but like they never, you know, I forget who said this first, but they never lose an opportunity to miss an opportunity, right? right? And there's a way in which like a lot of the gun stuff, specifically the Democrat, like the Republican response has the virtue of um, <coughs> it's stupid to be sure, but it has the virtue of like intellectual parsimony, mm-hmm. right? They say, well, we just need more guns. Right, the answer to every single problem is we just need more guns. Right, and there's a, there's a nicely hermetic sealed kind of character to that. Yep. Now, the, the dialogic, like dialectical opposite that the Democrats offer is not no, there should be no guns, which would be awesome to hear a couple times. But instead, they say, well, no, we just need to make sure the guns are in the right people's hands, and there has to be a waiting period. And, like, there's no. Even independently for how, like, those individual policy debates cash out, and we can talk about that, I'm happy to. Mm -hmm. But just in terms of, like, the moral landscape, right, on the one hand, we have one side that's saying something very extremist, right? Well, no, everyone should have guns everywhere, and there should be unlimited concealed carry reciprocity, and there should be armed teachers everywhere, and maybe even we should arm some students, I've seen people say. Um, and on the left, well, on the Democrats, who aren't really, but whatever, the Democrat response is basically, no, 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 we need to make sure that... We can. We don't want to take away all the guns. We agree that some guns are good. We just want to have a slightly more refined 
space to like it, it immediately as opposed to offering a moral vision they offer a moral vision bundled with a kind of immediately self-sabotaging technical answer mm-hmm. right it's a kind of technocratic retreat and it's very weird because like there's no um and there are very few other the republicans seem to, are very adept at weaponizing the extremism of their members on a host of issues right you can be an entirely functional republican and get elected and be like no there should be no abortions whatsoever and there should we should eliminate the minimum wage and and you may not know anything about the economy and you may not know what a uterus is but these are positions that republicans can say and you be be extremely rewarded for for holding and that other republicans will use as a as like a bargaining chip to be like, well, i got to appease these guys to my right. The left, the Democrats at least, are entering these conversations being like, well, I respect the Second Amendment, but, right, right. I respect our law enforcement. But the idea that, so just for once, for like negotiating purposes, it would be pretty awesome to hear some Democrat who is someone other than a fringe figure being like, no, we need to disarm. Police should not be carrying guns. It's screwed up that police are carrying guns, right? It's screwed up that the guns are in it, though we have this many guns. Guns are bad. And, you know, we don't hear that. That only exists as like a fantasy on the right that they put on Democrats, and Democrats more than willingly show up to, like, disavow it, right? The token of, it's almost as if a lot of Democrats have to signify that they're already willing to, they negotiate with themselves before they even enter into a negotiation with the, Demo- with the Republicans. Well, and right. And that's yeah. the classic, I mean, you know, the Republicans are synchronized and, you know, the the policies to get rid of the minimum wage fits with packing the courts to destroy unions, fits with structural tax redistribution to the top. I mean, you know, it, it, to have a coherent template to play and move on is actually much more effective strategically than just sort of having piecemeal kind of, you know, trying to sort of kind of bob and weave out of different situations, essentially. And some of them, you know, some Democratic politicians are much better at the tactics and the savviness than others, but they, they've been handicapped uh, from having an actual strategy. And I think there's a variety of just raw money, but also ideological reasons behind that. But, I mean, do you want to address briefly, like, what what would the democratic like what what are those proposals what are the implications of them i mean my only read i just want to put this into the mix is something like you know people forget that the root of stop and frisk in new york city which mm-hmm. you know is a universally or not universally but broadly understood to be you know a uh, racist policing tactic which in fact was struck down by a court and even somewhat reformed by mayor de blasio that has its roots in anti-gun program. So, you know, I think it's a very valid concern that people say, well, what is on tap? Does this just become another sort of, I mean, all of the racial and class dynamics we could put in, but even just more broadly, another area of responsabilization and putting on individuals and not as an example on, you know, the American gun cartel. I'm not interested in demonizing individual gun owners at all. I am very concerned about these companies. That's right, and that that's that's like so key, right? And this talk about again other like implicit logics, which are more than just neoliberalism, but like a certain type of double bind, where you hear people saying the common democratic response is these weapons of war, talking about AR-15s, do not belong on our streets. Where they belong? <laughs> exactly. That becomes the question, right? And even Chuck Schumer, like bless his heart, um, you know, has has, has pre- previous years gone to bat for Remington, for assault rifle manufacturers in his districts because they're all American companies that employ yep. Americans for jobs. And like, you can't have it both ways on these things, right? You, you you can't simultaneously be like these weapons are very very bad and they should not be used against Americans, but also I love making them and please let me take money from manufacturers or from arms industry lobbyists. Like that, you can't do both these things at once. Um, so, like, that's why, like, again, like, chips will cash out differently in terms of how various debates play out, but the lack of clear voices being like, all these objects are bad, this entire situation is for cocktail, the lack of that predisposes the, the discussion to go in certain directions. But that said, um, and I will say, too, like, I, I hear you on the question of racialized enforcement, and 
there's the answer to this is complicated. I, I, I struggle with it myself. I will flag first, though, that like this is a type of internal conversation that that you and I are having, and that a lot of Democrats will acknowledge, or like you know, ones who are good faith and savvy. You don't hear that same type of internal dialogue on the right. Where like, are we proposing something a little too hasty that might have adverse consequences? I mean, today uh, on the day of the no. year anniversary, we killed, yeah, <laughs> right. yeah exactly. of course like, not, yeah. It, it, it's yeah. just like it's very weird where it's like both the, the objections that are pr- proffered to gun control or to even talking about gun control, like imagine them on any other issue. And like today, the 16th right. anniversary of our launching a war based on nothing that killed a million people. And right. people are, and we didn't like, you know, people are being like, well, we shouldn't do anything about guns because there are a lot of innocent people that might be negatively affected by their inability to buy an AR 15. I'm like, there are a million dead Iraqis that we didn't question what would happen to them before we launched it. Like, there's a kind of, there's a weird double bind we put ourselves in. But, but independently of that, uh, vis-a-vis this question of, like, what we can do about this, my answer more and more is, like, well, first, the political stuff has to happen. There has to be people being like, this entire situation is wrong, right? That, so that, that, like, moral voice needs to be there. Getting into the specific stuff about policy, you're absolutely right. It, it has been totally the case that uh, gun control legislation in the 20th century from, you know, for, from, Reagan reacting against the Black Panthers, to the assault weapons bill getting bundled with the crime bill omnibus under Clinton, to the advent of stop and frisk. But it's always been a, there's always been an aspect of racialized enforcement. And so the question becomes for leftists is like, how much can we, maybe gun control isn't the right way to be talking about this. Maybe dealing with gun deaths is the way to be talking mm-hmm. about it. Maybe dealing with the question of violence is the way to talk about it. So the question then becomes very granularly, what are things that we can do that will actually lower the number of gun deaths that don't also give ground and empower the carceral policing state, right? Um, yeah. And to their credit, a lot of these kids in Parkland are like, well, we don't want school resources officers. Like, they don't want to feed the pipeline either. And yeah. that's, that's very hard yeah. to hear. Yep, yep. I mean, maybe elaborate on that sort of hopeful note, because I think that, you know, with the Parkland students, I mean, it's striking the way these students have emerged on a number of levels. And we don't, you know, we'll figure it out. And, you know, they're obviously super young, really savvy. Uh, maybe they say some things that uh, I disagree with from time to time. But that that's totally secondary to, first of all, the fact that they're taking power into their own hands and doing solidarity, just like you were pointing out in the beginning. They're de responsibility like their very act of banding together is a rebuke of all this neoliberal garbage and they're um you know they have actually emerged from this story like i know way more about them than i do about the shooter i you know they're just objectively more interesting to hear from than the same you know horrible hack nra propagandists or you know, middling, you know, kind of democratic, whatever, uh, they've got the actual charge and the vitality behind them. And they are making some of those distinctions you were pointing out. So, you know, maybe leave us, there is that hopeful note maybe there to leave us on. Yeah. I mean, like, I think the kids, the kids are, the the kids are all right. You know what I mean? They're being amazing. Um, And I I don't want to put them on too much of a pedestal. I'm not saying you're doing that, but I I want to be be clear, like what they are asking for and what they need is solidarity rather than like deference. Right. 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 right, Um, They need people to go go to back from all these different ways. But in terms of things that we can do concretely, first off, I think like it's important to remember that the problem of gun violence is not the same thing. The problem of mass shootings is only a subset of the broader problem of gun violence. And there's a way in which a lot of the conversation about mass shootings specifically becomes a a way of avoiding talking about gun violence more broadly, right? Where there's an implicit thing where we we just want to keep the violence in the play in, in like the in the urban hyper ghettos where it belongs implicitly. We have to reject that. So like the answer is to look at the problem of gun violence in terms of it actually being a problem that affects different groups in different ways, and then doing targeted interventions that deal with all those individual groups. So specifically, there are a lot of community activism programs that have been shown proven to inter to, to do what's called violence interruption yep. against urban gang violence. That works, and it doesn't necessarily involve the police. That's great, right? In vis-a-vis suicide, there have been a lot of unlikely movements, oftentimes within red states and even among gun shop owners, to, to attempt informally and otherwise to stop people who, who appear to be ready to kill themselves from buying guns, or at least, so, you know, can I hold this for you for several days? That also appears to have a real value at working, right? And then at the same token, too, talking about, like, what are the drivers of 
violence and acting out, to, try, to, to basically have points of intervention that deal with the misery of life that impels people to go ahead and, and become murderous rampagers, but to, to stop that earlier, to make them value their own lives more, to make them feel that they have a sense of possibility, to make them feel heard, right? And the trick is to do that through investment, to do that through giving people opportunities that are not just these sort of like fan neoliberal opportunities, but actually treat people like they're something other than just a number on a balance sheet. So like there are a whole suite of different policy interventions we can do, but the real thing is just to, to understand that this, is a, this, is, this problem keeps on happening. It's not reducible just to the mass shootings that get headlines and to have a, basically an intersectionally conscious awareness of the different people whose lives are affected by it. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I just want to amplify just, just two, I want to connect one thing and amplify one thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've actually talked, you know, to a couple of people more like in that gun world, including a gun shop owner. And I'm not, again, not doing a reverse idealization of anybody. I mean, they're like, like all businesses and like all interest groups, there's plenty of irresponsibility and lack of care. That's obvious, but con, but, but in contrast to some of the lazy assumptions we've get into, I mean, I've, some of those people, especially with specific kinds of interventions are far more conscious and serious about it on a ground level um, than a lot of the higher level conversations that sort of take place in some of the kind of easy categorization, which I think we need to get away from uh, on a cultural level, not on an industry level. I think those are separate things. And secondly, like, I mean, we could explain, expand the conversation. I mean, it implies there's a, there's a, there inside the United States, the way gun violence plays out in terms of different incomes and different neighborhoods and racial disparities. There's also a global small arms market, which the United States mm-hmm. and China, I mean, when we talk about what fuels so many conflicts and causes so many mass casualties internationally, a lot of it actually comes from, you know, again, there's the thought of like the big heavy artillery and underground arms traffickers and all of that is real, but there's also just the day in and day out of, you know, money flowing to uh, weapons flowing to everywhere from Mexico to Congo uh, that these companies at the very least are recklessly irresponsibly profiting from and we're doing nothing about. So we could have a much, much broader, more aggressive, full conversation and policy intervention and neoliberal intervention on all of it. Yeah, that's I mean, like this is the, the answer is to, is to come up with some I, you're absolutely right. Like small arms kill many more people than do like bigger missiles and, and all the sexier hardware out there. Like there is a way in which like the answer has to be coming up with a very clear organizing moral principle that ties together all these different subsets of violence and all the different institutions that are implicated in them. And my, my friend Daniel Denver has written about this very persuasively, but the idea of just talking about disarmament, actually disarming across the board, right, demilitarizing our society, like – you know, those are real goals. They may be utopian in some ways, but that's, they're only utopian relative to a certain calculus of realism, which is imposed on, upon us by people who are either cynical or, 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 or ignorant, right? And yep. so at, having a simple principle, it's like, no, no one should be getting shot anywhere. These weapons of war shouldn't exist on our streets or on other people's streets or on factories off our streets. And that's having a simple unifying, just like we need, we need, we need a proactive peace movement. And it's all part of that broader puzzle. But I think there's some moral clarity in just insisting that this does not have to be this way. This particular nightmare we're living in does not have to take this shape. It doesn't have to have this body count, both within our borders and outside them. And we need to have solidarity, both to, like, to attend to the problem in all its subsets of forms, but just to have this basic principle that this violence should not be happening, period, to anyone. Well, Patrick, really, really appreciate your time. Patrick Blanchfield, The Market Can't Solve a Massacre. It's in Splinter News. We have a link to it on the Majority.fm homepage. Patrick, really appreciate your time. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. Uh, Briefly, we need to touch on this as well. We started with Cambridge Analytica because, you know, this is of the moment. But as uh, Patrick noted in that conversation, 15 years ago today, and I'll be talking about this uh, fairly extensively in the opening of tonight's Michael Brooks show, 15 years ago today, the invasion of Iraq happened. Conservative estimates, a million Iraqis uh, died. Um, obviously, uh, many U.S. Uh, service members died. Untold PSD injuries, blown apart limbs. Uh, the roots of everything from IS to a new regional conflict uh, in the Middle East, which is burning it apart. 
Uh, it cannot be reducible to Iraq invasion, but it can't be separate from it. And it wasn't a blunder. It wasn't a mistake. It wasn't something that has, you know, egg on Bush or Blair or the architect's faces. It was a horrific lie-driven war of choice and a crime. This is George W. Bush. Never let him be rehabilitated. He shouldn't be joking around with Ellen. It's disgusting. Here he is announcing the invasion, March 19th, 2003. We'll play a minute of that. My fellow citizens, at this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. On my orders, coalition forces have begun striking selected targets of military importance to undermine Saddam Hussein's ability to wage war. These are opening stages of what will be a broad and concerted campaign. More than 35 countries are giving crucial support from the use of naval and air bases, to help with intelligence and logistics, to the deployment of combat units. Every nation in this coalition has chosen to bear the duty and share the honor of serving in our common defense. Nobody involved in this invasion should live it down, and they should be in fundamental penance and apology, and no one who helped architect this and propagandize for this should be rehabilitated and respected. And certainly not if they can just sort of acknowledge the fact that Donald Trump is an obscene racist clown. They participated in the prototype of the Trump administration, the Bush administration. People forget global torture regime, a lie-based invasion of Iraq, a invasion of Afghanistan that continues to this day and has killed many Afghans, the implementation of homeland security, spying, monitoring. And on the flip side, when he was doing a reach out, look it up, George W. Bush imposed steel tariffs too in the lead up to 2004 reelect. Yes, he isn't quite as obscene as Bush as a person, as a Trump as a personality, but there's no major disjuncture here. It's a pattern. And if we don't stop the obscenity, it will get deeper and deeper and deeper. We destroyed that country. And there's no idealization. Saddam Hussein was grotesque. He killed, raped, massacred millions. It's a disgusting gangster family. We went in there and destroyed it based off of lies. And it wasn't a mistake. It was a crime. Tonight on The Michael Brooks Show, Megan Day on the skills gap myth. We're going to talk about that 15 year anniversary, uh, have clips from Blair and Bush, but also Nelson Mandela and Yashka Fisher, because we're going to weave in the sort of history thread as we usually do on TMBS. Matt Bender is in here with a, a new uh, troll scam from Eastern Europe, which has hoodwinked the resistance. It's pretty funny. And also MRAs have a theory of why bridges are collapsing and it is not degraded infrastructure spending and, uh, austerity. It's lady engineers. <laughs> plus in the <laughs> plus in the post game for patrons, we're playing old Matt versus new Matt. It's a new game. And Jordan Peterson, there was a, a review. In addition, Nathan Robinson, Pankaj Mishra wrote a review in the New York Review of Books. Of, uh, and uh, Jordan Peterson got very upset. And he had a very messy room, Twitter storm, so we'll have some fun about that. Jordan Peterson, video. En- Jordan Peterson entered his own age of anger. He, yes, say. exactly. Jordan <laughs> Peterson was in the, the age of anger. <laughs> Patreon.com slash TMBS. Get the whole thing. Got the first animation uh, almost ready as well. The age of happy slapping. <laughs> the age of I will happily slap you. 646-257-3920. 646-257-3920. Hit us on the IMs. Check out the Jamie Peck Patreon page. Boom. Yeah. It's on. All right, everybody. See you in the fun half. See you in the fun half. Are you ready? <laughs> what, who sent us this? Anarchy. Alpha males are back. Back, 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 back. Boy,
back. And the alpha males are back. Back. Just as delicious as you can imagine. The alpha males are back. 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 And the alpha males are back. 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 Just want to degrade the white man. The alpha males are back. Back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back. 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 Almost as what? The alpha males are back. 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 You are a madman! And the alpha males are back. 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 I, I, I am a total cunt. Can we bring back DJ Denner song, please? Yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Denner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough of a break. That's fucking nonsense. Hey, folks! Fucking reminder! I do not have Parkinson's. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Fuck them. Fuck em. Uh, 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 uh. says what? 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 Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black African. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black. Donald Trump out there, doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. You can't knock the hustle. Come on! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck them! Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday! It's my birthday! Okay. Happy birthday to me, Jew boy! I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back. Back. Africans are black. Black. Alpha males are back. Back. Africans are black. Pay the price of blasphemy around here. I, 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 I am a total pussy. Total pussy, 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 pussy.